We've had some cloudy days here lately, and today somewhat gray, but it looks like the sun may be peeking out. And many days when we, when I think, when I see the clouds and the gray skies, I, I think of Genesis chapter 9, where God said he would put his bow in the cloud. And today I thought I would take a look at that rainbow that God promised and uh, see what kind of lessons we can learn from that rainbow and think of how it applies to us today. In Genesis chapter 9, we read of this promise given by God. Genesis 9 verse 8 God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. It shall, uh, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Here God made a covenant, he says, between him and the earth. And the covenant was that he would not destroy the earth with a worldwide flood ever again. And that that would be a covenant that would last through the end of the age, through the end of the world, through perpetual generations. Not just through Noah's generations or Noah's son's generations, or as is sometimes mentioned in the law of Moses through, through Jewish generations, but through perpetual generations, every generation to come. And so this covenant is uh, applicable today. That when we see that token in the clouds, that we remember God, that we remember His covenant that He made with Noah, that He made with man, that He made with the earth. And there are some things that I thought I'd point out about this covenant that we can witness for ourselves today when that bow makes its appearance. The first is that God is. The creation of God proves the existence of God, just as the rainbow itself proves the existence of God. In Genesis 1, verse 1, Genesis 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in verse 14 it says that uh, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon all the earth. Here we see uh, some other tokens, if you will, that show God's existence. The sun and the moon and the stars. I think generally people take these for granted. 
But when we see these, we, we should recognize that this is God speaking to us. That this is God's token of His existence. That He is proving to us uh, that this is me. This is me. When we see the sun, when we see the sun, uh, moon, when we see the stars, those are tokens of God's existence. They are, they are proofs. Just as that rainbow, when it appears in the cloud, is a proof that God is. The psalmist would put it this way in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, the first five verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. No doubt the rainbow is a proof of the handiwork of God. God is a true artist. And He has provided for us uh, the sun and the moon, the great lights that rule the day and the night. And not just that, but everything else that's in the firmament. But the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. And one such thing in the, in the firmament that shows His handiwork is indeed the rainbow, as we'll talk about in greater detail. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath He set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run in a race. The Bible tells us that nature cries out, that God's handiwork cries out and speaks to us today. Not miraculously, of course, but just by their very existence. Prove that there, there must be a creator, a designer, a sustainer, one that continues the process of the, of the day and the night. And when we see the rainbow, the same exists. The same individual that uh, oversees the day and the night, oversees the sunshine and the rain. And of course that brings about the existence of the rainbow as we see it. In Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 1, beginning of verse 26, the prophet Ezekiel says, Above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. So here Ezekiel and his prophetic mission is explaining something he sees uh, as it pertains to the throne of God and the firmament of God. And he says in verse 27, I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness, notice, of the glory of the Lord. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. When we see the rainbow in the cloud, do we say to ourselves, this is the likeness of the glory of the Lord? That's what all humanity should say. The psalmist said that the clouds, that the, the moon and the sun and the stars... They're His handiwork. The rainbow is His handiwork and they speak to us of the existence of God. And Ezekiel says, this is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It, pro it proves He is. It pro it's proof of His existence, of his, of his might, of His glory. And so when we see the rainbow in the cloud, we ought to think of, of the brightness of the Lord and the glory of the Lord and, and His very existence. It's also proof of God's desire to keep His promises. This was a promise that God made to Noah and through all perpetual generations that He would not destroy the earth with a worldwide flood ever again. And the Bible tells us that God is not slack concerning His promises. When He makes promise, He keeps His promise. 2 Peter chapter 3. 
2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. For, they, for this they willingly are ignorant. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment, and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God is not slack concerning His promises. When God makes promise, He keeps that promise. He made promise to Noah, he made promise to Abraham. He made promise to Moses. He made promise to, uh, to uh, all of the people of the world. And He makes promise to us today if we become Christians, if we will be obedient to Him. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, remember that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, could not disannul, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, says, God made promise to Abraham. He kept that promise to Abraham. God, uh, Abraham's lineage walked into the promised land after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and having been enslaved for over 400 years in Egypt. But after that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they walked into the promised land. They received the land. God kept His promise. That was no longer a promise to be kept, was it? Because it had been fulfilled. But another promise existed that had been given to Abraham and that was in the seed of Abraham would all nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, verse 1 and through, uh, through verse 3. So here Paul is talking about that seed promise. The land promised had already been fulfilled. Now the seed promise. Drop down to verse 29. Paul says, If you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That promise was fulfilled. All nations of the earth today have the opportunity to be blessed, to have their souls saved, because God made promise to Abraham that through his seed, and the seed here defined as Jesus Christ in Galatians 3, through that seed would come the opportunity to be saved. And that was fulfilled. God makes promises and He fulfills them, doesn't He? He keeps His promises. He kept His promise to Abraham, to His lineage as far as the land promise was concerned, and through Jesus Christ, all nations of the earth now have the opportunity to be blessed. And that blessing is for you and to me. When we see the rainbow, we, do we think of the promises or the covenant that God makes with His people? And recognize that when God says something, He means it, and He fulfills it. He fulfilled it in Christ. And if He had not, you and I would not have the hope of eternal life today. When we see the rainbow, do we think of the promises of God that ultimately bring about salvation that is through the Christ? Now, God made promise to Noah. God made promise to Abraham. God kept those promises, didn't He? In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 15. 
The Hebrews writer says, For this cause Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which were called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. See, when we think of the promises of God, we ought to think of the Christ and we ought to think of eternal life. And when we see that rainbow, that's exactly what that was, a token of the covenant that God made with man. God, it should remind us of the hope of eternal life. It should remind us of salvation, the promises of God to those who are faithful to Him. And so we see the existence of God, the, the, the nature, the rainbow itself speaks of God's existence. It shows off His handiwork. It reminds us that God keeps His promises and keeping His promises ultimately will relate to our salvation in the end. But sometimes we fail to, what do you say, see the forest for the trees. Right? Sometimes we... we uh, we fail to see the simple things, don't we? What do they say? Stop and smell the roses. Every now and then we need to stop and smell the roses, right? You know, sometimes it's just wonderful for us to look at God's handiwork and admire it. The beauty of God's handiwork, right? Yeah, it, it shows us the existence of God, the proof of God that, that this couldn't have come from nothing. It couldn't have come from slime. It couldn't have come from primordial soup it had a designer it had a creator it's beautiful isn't it God created a beautiful world and if you go out into the world and you see the beauty of the world the lakes and the rivers and the mountains and the, the trees and you don't see the beauty the handiwork of God then there's something wrong you're looking through a, a backward lens you're looking through a wrong a broken lens we need to look at the rainbow and just see the beauty of God's handiwork and admire it and stop and smell the rose, right? Roy G. Biv, right? Roy G. Biv. No, that's not the name of an individual. That's, that's how I was taught to remember the colors of the rainbow. Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, uh, blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Biv. Green. G. I missed G. How could I miss green, right? <laughs> uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Seven colors, right? Seven colors. All make up this rainbow. Scientists claim that these seven colors of the rainbow are actually the seven portions of what they call true light. That true light, pure light, contains these seven colors. Now, we don't always see those seven colors. We just see white light, right? We call it white or, or bright, right? There's some, sometimes it's, it's hard to define what light is, right? It's just, it's light. It's bright. But it contains seven colors. Roy G. Bibb. These seven colors are only seen when they're broken into seven individual parts by a prism. While scientists can refract light today because they understand this principle of breaking up the, the sections of the light using a man-made prism, and perhaps you've seen that done with, with glass or some other uh, mode, the colors are always backwards. The colors are always backwards because uh, they're not being seen as they are. They're being refracted, right? They're being seen upside down or backwards. The only one who could make it the way it is is God. <laughs> the only time you'll see Roy G. Biv is when God puts it there because that's how he made it. And uh, nature allows the water droplets in the clouds, the, the water works as the prism, uh, the natural prism that allows for the refraction of the light, or actually the prism nature of that light to happen. Now, I'm not, this isn't my own, I don't know exactly where I got this or remember where I got this, but I'm just going to read it. It talks about the scientific nature of the, of the rainbow, and I'll just read it to you and uh, let you know it's not of my own, but it's... Uh, uh, 
scientific information about the rainbow. It is an optical and meteorological phenomenon that causes a spectrum of light to appear in the sky when the sun shines on the droplets of moisture in the Earth's atmosphere. It takes the form of a multicolored arc. Rainbows caused by sunlight always appear in the section of sky directly opposite of the sun. In a so-called primary rainbow, which is the lowest and most uh, also normally the brightest rainbow, the arc of the rainbow shows red on the outer or upper part of the arc and violet on the inner section. This rainbow is caused by light being reflected once in droplets of water. In a double rainbow, and I'm not sure if you've ever seen a double rainbow, but I have, a second arc may uh, be seen above and outside the primary arc and has the order of its colors reversed. Red faces inward toward the other rainbow in both rainbows. This second rainbow is caused by light reflecting twice inside the water droplets. The region between a double rainbow is dark. The reason for this dark band is that while light below the primary rainbow comes from droplet reflection, the light above the upper or secondary rainbow also comes from the droplet reflection. And there is no mechanism for the region between a double rainbow to show any light reflected from the water. Although legendary triple rainbows in the same style and angle as double rainbows are impossible, you might some people have said they've seen triple rainbows. Uh, but actually, they're, they're seeing something else. Uh, according to this, the triple rainbow is impossible since a third reflection of light inside water would put their rays close to the direction of the sun, and they would thus be invisible. <clears throat> Some phenomena, such as supernumerary arcs, very close to and inside primary arcs, may be mistaken for triple rainbows. It is also impossible for an observer to maneuver to see any rainbow from water droplets at any angle other than the customary one. So you have to be at the right angle to see the, the rainbow. This information says it's 42 degrees from the direction opposite of the sun. That's the angle at which you see the rainbow. Even if an observer sees another observer, who seems under or at the end of a rainbow, the second observer will see a different rainbow further off. Right? <laughs> In other words, you can't ever get to the end of the rainbow. <laughs> you know, they talk about how there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and that's funny, right? It's, it's a joke, right? Because you can't ever get to the end. The different angle, you, once you start going towards it, your angle changes and the, and the angle of the rainbow changes because it's light. It's, that's all it is, right? It's light. You can't catch light. The second observer will see a different rainbow further off, yet at the same angle as seen by the first observer. Thus, a rainbow is not a physical object and it cannot be physically approached. Now you say, well, why'd you go through all that? Well, I think it's amazing, right? I think it's amazing that the beauty of a rainbow and how God made this rainbow, the majesty of God can be seen, right? In Psalm 139, Psalm 139, 14. The psalmist says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. When we see the rainbow of God, when we think of how marvelous the rainbow is, don't just think of it as, well, that's just reflection of light or refraction of light. Think of what I just told you. And think, when I think of God, when I think of the rainbow, I think we are marvelously made. The human body is a marvelous instrument as well, but the rainbow is too. Everything God made. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1.
beginning in verse 9. Paul writes, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you, not, you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet or acceptable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His, of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins." who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. When we think of the rainbow, when we see that rainbow, we need to think of the majesty of God, the Creator, right? the designer, and of the allusion to being brought out of darkness where light is eliminated, right? Darkness is simply a place where light is not. To bring us up out of darkness and translate us into the light. And that's what the rainbow is, right? The seven colors of pure light. We ought to think of that opportunity we've had to be brought out of darkness and into the kingdom of light. In Revelation 22, Revelation 22, when we consider these things, you know, how ought we to present ourselves to God, right? How ought we to present ourselves to God? The, knowing the majesty and the brightness of God, should we not try to appear worthy? Should we not try to make ourselves as one who walks in light as opposed to darkness? Right? Should we not uh, make ourselves... Uh, appreciate the things that God has given us and be the marvelous works that God has made us, right? When I see when I see man, I see the marvelous works of God, the handiwork of God. Rather than uh, applying that to some happenstance or chance, recognize that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And how should that make me want to act? How should that make me want to be seen by God? In Revelation 22, or uh, 21, I'm sorry, verse 2, John sees in the vision the new city. He says, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her, her husband. Here, the church is seen as a, as a bride from God, a bride of, from heaven for the, for the, for the Christ. The holy city, right? The new Jerusalem, the church. That's a, a, a picture of the church. Now, shouldn't we want to adorn ourselves as pure and holy if we're going to be in that body known as the bride of Christ? Notice verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. That's what God wants the church to be. And for us to be members of that church, we ought to want to keep that bride of Christ holy and pure and faithful and loyal, right? Another thing we can consider when we see the rainbow, and I'm running out of time, is the invariableness of the rainbow. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. Those seven colors are the seven colors of a rainbow. And they're seen in that order. In James chapter 1 verse 17, James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above 
and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We can trust God. We can know God will keep His promises because He doesn't change. And the fact that that rainbow doesn't change reminds us that God, when He tells us a thing, it is so. It's not going to change overnight on us. But I also want you to think of this as we uh, conclude. When we see the rainbow, do we remind ourselves that the Lord is coming back again? I, I don't think people have ever thought of that. But where did God put the rainbow? Genesis chapter 9, verse 14 and verse 16, He said, I will put my bow in the cloud. The Bible tells us that the Lord will come down in the cloud, descend to the clouds, and there we'll be caught up to meet with Him. Second Thessalonians. In Revelation 1, verse 5. Revelation 1, verse 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. He cometh in the clouds. You remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and verse 11, those disciples that would be the Christ apostles saw Him ascend. And what, was told, what were they told? He will come back as you saw Him go. He'll come back like you saw Him go. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, we read in verse 9 about how God is not slack concerning His promise. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Peter says, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There we're talking about when Jesus returns. We need to be looking for that last day, don't we? We need to be prepared for that last day when Jesus comes again to reward the faithful and to separate them from the wicked. God gave us ways to remind ourselves that He is, that He keeps His promises, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that there's a day when all this is going to end. And I think we can see that in the rainbow. And we ought to use that to our advantage to remind us every time we see that bow in the cloud of those very things and ultimately to remind us to remain faithful to God because His Son will return one day in the clouds just as that rainbow sits in the cloud. Today, if you'd like to place your name among those who are faithful to God by being obedient to the New Testament covenant, the covenant of obedience to the Gospel of Christ, made possible by the shedding of the Christ's blood, you can do so by hearing the word and believing it, repenting of your past sins, confessing that Jesus is the Christ and being immersed in water. The Lord adds those individuals to His church. The faithful, the saved, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And if we'll be faithful to the end, then when the Lord returns, we will be joyous and happy. And so if you've already obeyed those initial acts but have some other need, if you, if you have a private problem you need to deal with, deal with it privately. If it's of a public nature, we're here to assist you if we can as we stand and sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus.